renewable and integrated systems of energy, a technical model for the energy, water, sanitation, and recycling needs for a sustainable community. All right, we're, we are an interdisciplinary team composed of mechanical and environmental engineering students. Myself, Michael Enriquez, Robert Carcise, Sergio Batodano, and our advising professor, Dr. Andres Ramante. And we have an environmental side, Natalia Duque, and Paolo Davos, and their advising professor, Dr. Baron Tassel. So our project addresses increasingly difficult issues to manage um, across the globe. Things such as poverty, uh, inadequate access to safe drinking water, classification for global warming are not isolated things. They're all connected and they feed off each other, causing great environmental problems as well as health and socioeconomical issues in many regions across the world. So when people ask us why we didn't um, produce just one product, it's because there's not one solution to address all of these major problems. We are in need of an integration of components uh, through various disciplines to address these issues. And that's why our project presents the integration of technical com com components to um, facilitate the creation of a sustainable com uh, community. So things such as uh, energy and water uh, and sanitation and recycling. Through this, we our motivation is to address these global issues from the interdisciplinary standpoint. So we basically model the tent home community to assess our design considerations and the economic considerations for the implementation of the different components in our project. Um, when we started this uh, project, we had the following objectives that we wanted to fulfill. Uh, the first objective being uh, we want to uh, create this charging station right here in the EC. Uh, it's located on the east side, and with that, we also want to acquire real time data using uh, software to actually uh, to simulate the tropical regions such as here in South Florida. We wanted to also design and redesign the hydro turbine that can manufacture with recycled materials and use it for testing purposes. As well, we wanted to assess the feasibility of grid harvesting system, integrated with water filtration, and potential energy recovery. We also investigated biological treatment options for household wastewater, and we designed and tested an anaerobic digester for uh, to treat the organic wastes. We also designed and manufactured a recycler, which would, which would essentially turn um, some of the most common thermoplastics into usable 3D printing filament. So our journey, our journey begins with the solar energy unit. Here we have a 210 watt um, rated solar panel. Uh, one of our uh, big uh, concerns is uh, housing the, the, the units and where we could be safe from the from weather such as rain, storms, and, and, and theft. So we, we located the solar energy unit right outside of the east side campus right by the gazebos and with this we want to uh, promote social benefit to have engineering students also uh, have their ideas developed so they can use this so they can implement them to the, the university and the community can see them. Now here we housed our, our components in a locker that's well ventilated uh, one, of the, one of the difficulties that we had is actually getting all these components together, making them fit and, and be safe, and be a safe uh, way to harness uh, our energy. So some component breakdown here, we have a breaker box, a charge controller, an inverter, the main three used for data logging, and we have two uh, 12 volt deep cycle batteries. Some of the social benefits we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about is a charging station, and this system is also very adaptable. It can uh, work in a wide range of environments, and its portability it can be taken anywhere like for example in this locker we can just set it up whenever we want whatever we want now here we have uh, the electronic schematic of our uh, components here so like i said the 210 watt create a 420 pv array now for safety reasons we use circuit breakers we have two circuit breakers that are uh, 60 amps that are in series from the pv array to the charge controller now the charge controller its main job is to regulate the charge to keep the batteries at an optimum um, voltage level, not too high, not too low. And from the charge controller, we have a three-way cat five cable that we use for data acquisition, data logging, and we can get data from the second up to 60 seconds, however we want. Um, the battery bank is uh, two 12 volt batteries combined make a 24 volt uh, battery uh, 24 volt um, volt battery bank and combine 105 amp hours. And at the end, we have a 250 amp circuit breaker that is going to be connected to the inverter, which is going to turn the DC current from the solar panels to AC current, 
therefore you have enabled to charge um, cell phones or laptops at 120 AC. Now here are some um, charts that we were able to gather from the main three. On the top top right we see a two-week summary. Now here we see like a peak around 31st of March, which denotes uh, you know, clear skies at around 1.2 kilowatt hours. Now the bottom table shows what happens in a 24-hour span. Here we can see uh, some uh, energy starting to be stored at right around 7, and it peaks up around 1 o'clock at about 200 watts, 1 hours, and dies down right around 6 or 7 o'clock. Now the top right picture we show a design that we have uh, of a technical of a community that we, that we model. Now each cluster is composed of 10 homes and the idea is that each home is going to have the same solar panels, so it's uh, 420 watt array. And we want to uh, see if the, our, our system is able to supply energy, enough energy for them to, to live comfortably in the research that we require for a third world country such as the basic electrical needs. Um, basic electrical needs means uh, uh, Light bulbs, stereos, small fan, a fridge, we have a washing machine, just the essentials. We calculated that per day the household is going to uh, need about 1.16 kilowatt hours and on the monthly basis it's going to require 35.38 kilowatt hours per month. Now uh, the average power that we got here is 31 kilowatt hours per month. So that gives us a 4 kilowatt hour net difference per month that we need to supplement our, our household. And that is, it, it calculates about 87.7% that the solar unit is going to, uh, um, is able to give them the energy they require. So the remaining of the energy is going to be supplemented by other renewable sources, such as hydro energy that uh, CISA would explain to you. Okay, sir. So this is the hydro energy system that we told about. We set up an experimental system in order to find out how water is converted to electrical energy. So here we have a pedal turbine, which is the center of our hydro system. This is an impulse type of turbine that uses head elevation in order to convert that flowing energy into, into electricity. So this pedal turbine we have is modeled using data and references provided to us that we found online by in reputable journals. We 3D printed that turbine and we were able to run some tests. So the main housing of the hydro energy system is composed of this solid wooden frame. This wooden frame houses all the major components. We have a three quarter inch PVC pipe that conveys the water throughout the whole system. It has at its inlet a pressure regulator which will vary the incoming water pressure to a value of 15 to 90 psi. This will be what we use in order to evaluate the different head elevations by varying the pressure. And also the same three quarter inch PVC layout that you see here has at its end a nozzle. The nozzle would spray the jet, the fine jet of water to the water wind turbine which causes the spinning. This rotation is going to run this generator which is coupled here and this DC voltage we have is unsteady because of the nature of this generator. So we had to use electronics in place which is composed of the rocker switch and the uh, rocker switch to prevent any electrical malfunctions a bridge rectifier and also a power inverter in order to bring out that power. Before we began construction, we ran some simulation studies on our board. So we used SolidWorks and SolidWorks missed data on PLA. So we went to a prospect website, IES.com, in order to retrieve that data. So what we did was evaluate our maximum elevation, maximum RPM, that those values you see here. And then from there, we apply that torque to the face of the, of the rudder here. So what happened is we have this rotation on the rudder that will cause the maximum bone missile stress on the shaft of the shaft, and this shaft, the, the collision to the shaft and the support. And this value came out to 641.5 PSI with a minimum factor of safety of 13.78. So we concluded that this was a reason to save design to go with. The next simulation was involved the puddle. The puddle itself receives the water, so it needs to be solid. What we did was run an analysis and use 45 psi at first on the splitter, which is the action that happens. The water hits the splitter at a 0.25 inch. It doesn't hit the whole splitter, it only hits a 0.25 inch diameter circle. So we applied that load and we found out that the maximum volume stress 
happen are the connections between the paddle and the disc itself. And it was evaluated at 670.4 years. So some of the challenges that we encountered during this hydro, range, the hydro system setup was doing construction. At first we chose a low quality plywood pressure treated plywood here that you can see and it created some challenges to put the parts together. So it was really painful. So we would recommend better quality wood for the future and also be wary of the tolerances in 3D printing when you reprint parts together. Next is the hydro rain system which is going to be presented by the third. Um, so our hydrological technical model includes the harnessing of rain. Uh, it consists of an interconnected water network that begins at each household with the collection of rainfall and then the distribution and storage of the water into village and community plants for later use. This system has an um, has um, eco fee used for energy potential for energy recovery depending on the region's topography. So it also, the system also includes a, a, a slow sun titration system. This system removes bacteria, viruses, and parasites through biological process on the top layer of the sand here, and also through mechanical, the mechanical properties of the sand itself that removes small particles. Um, small particles. Uh, with this system, you can get up to 90% contaminant removal. Now, for the, for the, for the treatment of the wastewater, the wastewater can be treated in different ways depending on, on its source. If the water comes from sinks, from the washing dishes, clothes, from the shower, it's called gray water, and it can be uh, treated using constructed wetlands. These are engineered systems that mimic the natural conditions of wetlands. They remove uh, biochemical oxygen demand, suspended solids, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and pathogens through a combination of biological, chemical, and physical properties. So the, the treatment occurs as the water flows through the medium and through the plant's rhizosphere, where anaerobic and aerobic microorganisms uh, help the decomposition of organic matter. Also, the suspended solids are filtered out uh, as they settle, and the harmful bacteria and the viruses are reduced through filtration and also absorption onto, onto the rock medium. Now, on our technical report, we included a whole uh, assessment of constructed wetlands. It includes the type of constructed wetlands there are. It also includes the, the recommended vegetation type to use, the sizing parameters, and also the, um, the cost analysis. Now, Paul is going to explain some more treatment for biological. So the other type of waste that, that, that gets produced in a household is considered black water. And we investigated a very exciting um, model, which is an anaerobic digest digester. Basically, it's, uh, it breaks down um, any type of organic uh, matter, or organic components, in an oxygen-free environment. And not only does that produce uh, a waste stabilization and a pathogen inactivation, but you also get valuable byproducts. So you can basically put inside of this uh, tank any organic waste like manure, uh, sewage, or food scraps, agricultural waste, anything that can, can be broken down. And the valuable products that we that can achieve are first um, a biofertilizer that's rich in uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, so it contains all of the nutrients from the initial organic matter, but without any of the harmful pathogens. And you can use that for applications such as soil conditioning, or for fish ponds, or also for algae ponds and to produce algae, which is new biomass that can be fed into the digester to produce more biogas, which is another food product. And the biogas is rich in methane. If it contains about 70% methane. The rest is uh, carbon dioxide and other trace gases. On the top right-hand corner, we see our proposed uh, uh, system for a rural community, which would be the Hanata Biodigester. It's a Chinese variation of a digester. And we chose this one because of its simplicity of construction. It has no moving parts. It doesn't require any steel. And it's very cheap to, to make. So it's very simple. It doesn't require a lot of maintenance, um, things like that. And um, basically, we, 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 went, we, we set out to um, design it for a model community of 10 households, uh, assessing that each household requires one cubic meter of biogas for their cooking needs. So uh, my team members, they address the electricity needs of the community, but another main energy component is the cooking needs. And a lot of rural communities depend on 
the burning of biomass for cooking, which creates a lot of health hazards. So this is a, a very good alternative to that. So based on our requirements, we needed 10 cubic meters storage for our tank. And here are the plans that we came up with. And we also assessed basically like where we can get the biogas from based on the amount of animals that a community could probably have and the amount of food waste produced. On the top right hand corner, we see our little miniature version of a digester that we made. This was to explore the co-digestion capabilities of the system and also to, to explore a two-phase digester that has a floating drum and the fixed uh, digester as well. Now, uh, Michael will explain the recycling mechanism. All right, so the interesting about plastic is that plastic is made for the last very long time, although it's used for a very short amount of time. So what that creates is this abundance of plastic, abundance of plastic littering the world. So our solution to that is to create this, what we call our recycler. And the recycler essentially, begin, the process begins over here with a shredder. Uh, this shredder is gonna be manually operated by a long arm uh, wrench, which the user would go ahead and place, uh, let's say any kind of thermoplastic, let's say the cap of the deter detergent bottle or uh, or a water bottle, for example, and it'll grind it up into pieces to about 0.25 inches in, uh, inches in cube. So once those pieces uh, are ground to the size, it's placed into this hopper here, and it'll fall into a Schedule 80 pipe, so, um, steel pipe. And within the pipe, you're gonna have, we have a tool steel auger, which is being rotated by a stepper motor. Now the bits will travel up this uh, down this pipe here to this heated section, and we have here an aluminum sleeve, which within the aluminum sleeve, we have a cartridge heater, which heats up to about 350 degrees Fahrenheit, which we found through trial and error to be the optimal extrusion temperature. Now, uh, as soon as more and more plastic connect collects here, it ends up being extruded out of this nozzle about 1.80 millimeters in diameter, and we found that at 1.80 millimeters in diameter, once it extrudes, it, was, it would compress uh, after it's cooled using these fans to about 1.75 millimeters in diameter, which is the, 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 the diameter of the filament necessary for 3D printing. So, next slide please. All right, so here we have the actual, our actual extruder, which you see here. Uh, it's very different, or relatively different from our proposed design, although it functions in the same manner. And here we also have a, the circuit diagram, which essentially we have AC power going in, uh, live, ground, and neutral, feeding into this terminal block and uh, it feeds current and, and voltage to, to the necessary components, the cartridge heater, the stepper motor, temperature controller, and if we feel that the most important uh, part of this process is right here in the temperature controller and solid state relay because they work together to, to determine the, the temperature of the cartridge heater to fluctuate between five degrees of 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, next slide. Please. So this is a short video demonstrating uh, from beginning to end the process of extrusion. So it gets ground up here manually, as I explained, and uh, bits are then collected in this um, in this mail. It's a little unsafe, yes. <laughs> um, so here, here are the pieces, and oftentimes we would have to run the pieces again because it would be a little bit too large. And here we have an extrusion of about four feet per minute, which is what we intended to do, and we we found that that was that was done through an RPM of about 45. Okay, so we were able to extrude this longest filament here uh, of about 24 inches, and that extruded at 30 seconds, so four feet per minute. And although the diameter varied, it stayed roughly within 1.75 millimeters of diameter, uh, although it was not long enough to create what we intended, which was a, a, test, a, a test specimen so that we can test for various mechanical properties. Although we found that the solution to this is to be able to funnel Instead of having two cooling fans uh, that would that would cool the filament as it extrudes, we would want to create a manifold attached to the cooling fan that would direct air directly to where the filament is going, as opposed to an open area. Okay, so this is briefly how we see all of these different components being integrated into a community in the future once the products become optimized. Plastic waste that gets uh, collected can be put into recycling. This creates a micro enterprise based on recycling uh, recycled plastic goods. Uh, one application that we explored was a micro hydro turbine, which can be connected to a catching and filtration system. We also have the solar energy input. The waste that gets uh, produced from a house 
can be treated in two ways. If the house has a, if the community has a septic tank or any sort of uh, sewage treatment, then they would only need to treat their gray water so they can basically reclaim that water for other purposes. The black water waste goes into the digester with all of, other, the, all of the other components, creating a closed loop cycle and creating biogas for the community as well. Here in this slide, we can see two different economic analyses. On the top right, this is an account of the actual costs that we have for the construction of the different prototypes. Uh, uh, it was about $2,400, uh, and most of it come from funding. Uh, now here, you can see a cost projection for, for a 10-home community model. Uh, most of the expenses come from the solar power unit. Uh, this is partially associated with the use of batteries for energy storage. That's why for future research, we, we recommend the study to study on, on more like storage, energy storage systems, such as most coal compressed air and pump hydro storage systems. So in conclusion, um, we can treat our waste using biological processes that do not put greater strain on the environment. You, we can view our waste as a resource from which we can recover valuable products such as energy or recycled material. And uh, we can fulfill our energy needs from renewables if we put further research on a decentralized energy storage approach. And we believe by integrating all these different components, we can achieve sustainable development. We would like to acknowledge quickly the following people for their support and contribution to our project. Dr. Andres Tremante, Javier Palencia, Alberto Hernandez, Mr. Sicarelli, Stephanie Strange, Adam Anasakis, uh, Dr. Shanay Laha, and Dr. Sukuna. Thank you very much. Let me start off so you can get rid of it. you have a question too? Is this Terry? Oh, I'm yeah. the first son? No. Oh, oh. Right. go ahead. Who, right. who funded this multidisciplinary project? It was mainly funded by the um, Global Civic Engagement Student Advisory Board. Oh, okay. It's so up there in that fine French on there. You um, should put your sponsor really big up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I walked out of the room to deal with something, so tell me. Uh, if I missed the slide that dealt with the timeline and the division of labor, could you just uh, bring that back? Uh, did you talk about that? We didn't mention it for the time constraints, but we can go over the, the, the distribution of labor that we had. Okay. Um, basically, we all collaborated together on, on most of the, the components, of, although we all had our individual um, kind of area of research. Um, Michael basically he did the, the research and the uh, parts acquisition for the recycler. The assembly was done by the mechanical students. Same situation with the water wheel. Um, Cita did a thorough um, investigation on the water wheel and then you know acquired the parts and the assembly was also done by them. Um, the energy component, we all worked on it together to, to make it happen, to make that mobile charging station outside and the sanitation and water was shared about the responsibility by Natalia and myself. And uh, how specific were you in addressing the uh, mobile component of your evaluation? Uh, I may have missed that too. Yes, yeah, so the problem statement basically addresses um, the, uh, the global um, the global components. So like we mentioned, the, the main issue that we have is, is, is creating an interdisciplinary um, model for to address the global issues. So, you know, this is like as global component as it gets in terms of projects. <laughs> so this is where we uh, kind of talked about the different global issues that we have and how we are planning to address those. And, through the interdisciplinary standpoint, and also, you know, not only integrating the different disciplines, but different um, technical components and new areas of research, like the recycling. That's a new area of research that we're exploring that needs to be optimized. Same thing with the cold digestion capabilities of anaerobic digesters. It's something that's very big that's happening here in the United States, with EPA and everything. All right, thank you for that. I stepped out of the room when that slide was up. So, any other questions, Dr. Basil? Uh, uh, so I had a quick question. If you could go to this library where you define all of your different uh, integrated components that you talk about, um, maybe power. Uh, 
that, yeah, sure, that's perfect. Okay. Um, the one thing that I think you guys are missing is atmosphere control of, of a home, right? So we live in Miami only because we have air conditioning. And I think you're integrating all of these systems, but I think maybe one of the biggest systems that you might have left out was some sort of cooling, right? And so I think the other hard part of that is cooling is predominantly the highest energy cost of all of the things. So anyway, it, I think you guys have such a huge scope, it's kind of hard to complain about scope. Um, but I would just say that's, that's something that's very important uh, overall. Then I have a quick question about the actual recycling. So how much energy does it take to run it? Uh, that we did not calculate. Okay, because so that could be very, very important in terms of sustainability, right? I mean, it may cost more to run that thing than you get out in the recycling right. parks. Absolutely. Um, then one more CSA. I'm going to have to think of this. Can you go to his? This is just I. Which side would you like? Um, go back a little bit. I'll let everybody else ask the question. My friend. So in the upper, no, no, one more. You're in my class, right? <laughs> what, what do you see on that slide that I would complain about? Yes, oh, 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 terrible, oh, right? The seal strength was 6.09, 497, it was a 7, right? I mean, that's 60.9 megapascal, right? So everyone understands 60.9 megapascal. No one understands 609, 497. Anyway, I'll let everyone else. <laughs> Toronto? Yeah, the, the questions I have, uh, I'll start with the solar system. You, you communicated that it had the ability to produce 31 kilowatt hours per month. Yes. Um, did you look at multiple months over a year and, and assure that every month you had 31 kilowatt hours? Unfortunately, we did not. We were able to um, actually get all the components, uh, not necessarily in, in range of our timeline. Um, we were at a difficult time right? getting all the components together, and once we did, we were left with about three weeks of actual raw data, and so we were just able to gather those three weeks of official data. But since we could have the but I mean, you can get this. This is this data exists. This is data you would have to produce. You well, we you wanted to actually get like actual real time data. We didn't want to. We have. We have um, some of the information on the report, but we want to get the real time data of actual. But at least know what the range the is. Range is yes. So that you could understand that, you know, maybe in um, in December you're only getting 20 kilowatt hours, and now all of a sudden I have to manage a bigger piece of the puzzle. Yes. Okay. Second question on the hydroelectric system. I assume it, in order to make this make any kind of money, you've got to have adequate head. Is has, did anybody look at what? kind of head would be required in order to make this thing be effective. Right, so usually flat water turbines are used for a kind of a minimum of 10 meters. As long as you have 10 meters, the turbine is supposed to be efficient. Okay, do I have 10 meters continuous flow? 10 in meters of elevation. Okay. Yeah, okay. It's used pressure okay. rather than flow rate. Okay. So like, the main concern to run a flat water turbine would be the head elevation. Flow rate would be, you need some kind of flow rate, but it's not your main component. Like, so in our case, what we did was use a pressure regulator to be able to vary this head elevation from the pressure. So we can model different head elevations. But is the system designed in a fashion that I can, that I've got a continuous flow of water? Well, you have the PVC pipe, which you see over there. This connection here allows you to put the water in the system and you can have continuous flow. But this is an experimental setup. A real setup will have you having a, what they call a penstock. A penstock diverts the flow of water from the river uh, from a high elevation, and you have a penstock that comes, brings the water to the system, and once the water flows through the platform turbine, it exits okay, the so water system. My assumption then is this town is sitting next to a river. Well, which is the assumption I need to, 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 to mention a little bit about that, we, we kind of uh, thought about two different scenarios, whether you know if there is a body of water of any type of stream that we can harness water from, then that could be used. And we also thought that if we could recover some energy from the waterways of the interconnected uh, rain harvesting system. One way could be, for instance, like elevating water in a in a water tank, and then you know the flow of water being able to to run the the pulp and mill as well. So again, continuous flow. Continuous again, flow continuous, continuous flow, or to 
to be able to store the energy it'll, in that way. It'll be continuous flows since it's producing the, the watts. So as long as the, the, the as long as it has the tank has the required water, enough water, and there's the water is there, it will be continuous flow and it'll, it'll produce the, the rated wattage that it's going to be. Okay. Next question. One one of you said that you had an issue with the tolerancing on the 3D printing. Um, or I guess the water will be parts. Yes. Could you explain to me how you went to that different today? Well, mostly it was trial and error by printing a few like uh, So I have a 3D printer at home and it was very simple just to print a couple different pieces and just vary the, the size of the mating parts. And uh, that's that's how we found the, the proper the Did you do that with extrapolation or did you do that with trial and error? Trial and error. The pieces were small enough so that the prints would take only about maybe 10 minutes. So it was worth just printing several sized pieces until we found the right one. Okay. On the wetland, how thick does the segments have to be, if you walk me through there, to ensure that I'm not going to pass through uh, well, there are fluid, not uh, gray fluid that doesn't turn out to be clean in the background? Right. Uh, you mean like the sides of the Yeah, wetland? what's the scale? Well, it's not that, uh, that big, actually. It goes about, um, it could be about like half, half, like a foot dip, so it's not that long. And it depends on, depending on the size that you want it for, like how many households you want, it can be, up to, it can be scaled, but it's not gonna be longer than maybe five feet. Well, where my question really plays is, I, I'm assuming there's gotta be a minimum rhythm this time, that yeah. water has to travel through this system yeah, yeah, yeah. to have the ability to, uh, to function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do you know what that is, or the retention time. Um, I'm not. Sh I'm not about sure. One, one, one week, or yeah, basically that's. So from the time it goes in to the time you, you take it off the back end. Well, you don't really take it off. It actually goes through a week. continuous through. process. So it just, I guess, the residence time just gets um, controlled by the actual rock media that is used. So um, you just control by the wetland. It's yeah, like, I'm hoping you would know that. This layer needs to be this thick yeah. and that one's in yeah. order to yeah. be able to achieve the ultimate. Yeah, exactly. Like it has different, like the, the bottom layer is made of gravel, and then you know you have different layers of sand and soil to to, to optimize that that flow. And in the, in the back end, that's where you have the treated water. In the in the front, you have already a primary treatment to to separate um fat, oil, and sediment so that it doesn't have you know the distribution system as well. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how you assign the responsibility to review your written report when you went through it. Um, you have a tremendous number of formatting errors. Even your table of contents, your numbers are not to three index number four, and now you're you're all out of whack. Your other thing is when you page, when you print a report, you want to make sure your headers, when you print your pages, are going to line up right above your tables. You don't want your header ending off at the bottom of the page with your content coming to the next one. So be careful when you get to your final stage that your document is how you want it to do. You want to make sure you proofread. All right. I have one question about the, um, the little analog digest that you had. I'm, I'm curious when you had it operating, what did you feed it? I mean, what was the plan? Oh, oh, it should, well, the, the, basically the seed is horse manure. So that's what we put to create a healthy amount of methanogenic bacteria inside of it. And then we began feeding it food scraps on a daily basis as a semi-batch reactor. And we basically came into the situation of the operational temperature limit limitation that we have because uh, the reaction rate is heavily dependent on the methanogenic growth which is temperature dependent. So could you get the temperature build up by the bit? The, 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 the only problem that we had is that when we began the, the operation the temperature was fluctuating a lot and we did not have an external source of heating for the actual digester because we wanted to avoid that. Yeah. So um, further uh, investigations. We plan on, on continuing. We have it at my, my, my apartment, so we're going to continue, you know, feeding it throughout the summer and trying to maintain it at an optimal temperature of 95 degrees so we can, you know, 
investigate a little bit more about the biogas uh, amount that we can choose. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for that.